We've been talking lately with Joseph Lindsley in Ukraine about how things have been relatively quiet in Ukraine since the uh, start of the war in Israel. But now there's word that Russia has ramped up the intensity of its attacks on Ukraine. And is this right, uh, Joseph, uh, the most attacks in a day since the start of the war in the last 24 hours or so? Uh, That seems to be correct, Bob. Hello from Kharkiv, uh, 30 miles from Russia, although there's an important distinction. So Russians have still uh, not launched a major nationwide missile and drone attack on Ukraine uh, since September. Uh, really since Ukraine uh, did heavy damage to Russia's Black Sea Naval Fleet headquarters, September 22nd. And then that uh, uh, that day, that same day, the White House promised Ukraine long-range ballistic missiles, which Ukrainians have been using uh, to good effect. And since then, and even now, uh, there have been no major uh, Russian attacks on Ukrainian cities deep within the country. Uh, and, and this is still notable. In fact, so it seems that what, what Russians are doing, you know, everyone had expected uh, these wintertime infrastructure attacks that happened last year. Last year, they began on October 10th. It's now November 1st, and we've had yet to have a single one of these major infrastructure attacks that we used to experience every, almost every single week uh, last winter. When Russia would often send 80 to 100 missiles in a day uh, to Ukraine. That is not happening. Instead, what we have uh, yesterday, uh, Russians shelled 118 Ukrainian localities in 24 hours. That has not been seen uh, since the beginning of 2023. And these localities are close to the front lines. And so what this does suggest uh, is that, you know, at least the Russians, I mean, the question we have to ask is that the Russians are not capable of launching these long range attacks. Are they waiting for something else? Are they waiting to see how things shake out in Israel? But there is definitely a change in tactic. They are no longer Uh, launching massive drone and missile attacks on Ukrainian cities far from the front. Instead, they are terrorizing uh, those localities near the front lines. Uh, For example, uh, yesterday, a friend in Nikopol, which is a city from which I've reported to you uh, several times, it's on the Dnipro Reservoir, which now is a desert, by the way, since the Russians destroyed the dam back in June. Uh, We still we can forget that easily, but they've really changed the landscape there. Nikopol is across the water, or what used to be the water, uh, from Russian-occupied uh, parts of, uh, uh, of Ukraine, including the largest nuclear plant in Europe. And Nikopol has been shelled almost every day. Uh, there, there's some shelling activity. And then a friend, so they've, they've been through hell and they're used to it. Uh, but then a friend from Nikopol wrote me yesterday, and he says that uh, they have attacked us four times already today. This was yesterday afternoon. He said they've started to use the Iranian kamikaze drones Upon us, he says, it has never been that intense uh, ever. Uh, these attacks on Nikopol, and then this morning, the same friend from Nikopol wrote me, and simply said, "Very bad night." And then again, from early morning, the shelling continues, and so we see Russians unable, it seems, or not willing to want, make these long-range attacks. Which you know, many of those missiles were fired uh, from the the Russian naval fleet in the in the Black Sea. That is not happening, but we see extremely intense shelling of villages and cities along the front lines. That fleet in the Black Sea was hit by uh, by Ukraine a while back, wasn't it? Yeah, that was September 22nd, and it was September 21st. President Zelensky was in Washington, and, and the White House said, we're not going to give you these long-range attacking missiles. The next day, Ukraine used uh, a few of the Storm Shadow missiles provided by United Kingdom uh, to great and precise effect and targeting very specific Russian military targets in the Crimean Peninsula. And a few hours later, the White House, it seems that they were persuaded. They said, hmm. sure, we, we see that you can do it. Uh, here are uh, here are some, uh, you know, long range weapons, which Ukrainians have been using and they are still using. Uh, we also almost every day now we have reports of strange activity uh, in the Crimean Peninsula uh, that bridge the Kerch Bridge that the Russians built. Uh, after they occupied Crimea in 2014, uh, uh, which connects Crimea to the Russian mainland, uh, there's a lot of smoke there today. The Russians said they were making a smoke screen. Uh, we don't know exactly what's going on. Uh, and meanwhile, there is this horrible story. I mean, there's horrible stories every day, but a horrible story of a uh, Ru- uh, Ukrainian village in occupied in, in territory occupied by the Russians uh, in Donbass, and uh, Russian soldiers wanted to commandeer 
a family house and the family refused to leave. And so the Russians murdered all nine of them, mm. uh, including some children uh, and as young as an eight year old girl. And this is exactly what we see, you know, the scenes that we see uh, from what Hamas uh, was doing to the Israelis. And then even as this happens, uh, I heard from uh, people in Chicago, the Ukrainian consulate in Chicago and the Ukrainian Congress Committee of America. They held a protest yesterday on Halloween uh, in Chicago because there's that Chicago based company, uh, Mondelez, which continues to do business uh, in uh, in Russia. They're the makers of Oreos. And so much, you know, other sort of, you know, snack food. Mm -hmm. And they continue to do business. And Axios had a story about this today. Mondelez refuses to offer comment. Uh, previously, they said, well, you know, they have to make sure that the people of Russia uh, get food. And, and this is where I think this is one of the, the a question that arises also in context in, in the context of what's happening with uh, Israel and Gaza. But, you know, is it do do the people permit the regimes to cause the evil that they cause? And and if the people, you know, and, and the argument for those who want, you know, uh, Russia's economy to suffer is that if, if the Russian people do not feel pain, they will not resist the regime that is unleashing hell upon the world. And, uh, and so so there is this push to and there was a demonstration yesterday in Chicago pushing companies like Mondelez not to do business uh, with Russia. And then there's even, you know, that's only food. But then there are also companies that manufacture uh, this uh, technology that helps build weapons. And that, that, I think, is going to become a bigger story. It's been very much under the radar, uh, but there still are, I mean, the Russians are able to work around uh, sanctions and still able to get a lot of the supplies they need to continue to build weapons. Uh, and all of this sort of gets missed, uh, you know, in, uh, you know as, as, as time moves on uh, during this uh, long war. Hmm. Uh, talking about food, uh, we've got a text from a listener about uh, the story you told us yesterday, uh, Bob, here's an article about the Japanese gentleman that was mentioned by Joseph Lindsley. And then uh, this person sent me pictures of the uh, Japanese cafe owner feeding Kharkiv. And it's really remarkable. He runs that free cafe, as you uh, said yesterday. And uh, he's 75 years old. The operation is funded mostly from donations coming from Japan. And then in this information the listener sent me, Joseph, uh, it says here the Tokyo native spent seven months living alongside Kharkiv residents inside the city's subway system as Russian shells and rockets. Rockets rained down through much of 2022. He told the journalist, I will live in Kharkiv after the victory. I do not have a house in Japan. I sold everything. So I'm here forever and will help Kharkiv. You, you mentioned this yesterday. And I'm looking at the pictures of him with the people there. It's it's quite quite a great story, isn't it? Yeah, and it was so great when I happened to be walking through the park and I saw uh, I saw him there in the park. And, and the way that all the Ukrainians who saw him, everyone that passed by stopped to give him a hug to give him money, uh, to take pictures with him. And he's well loved for his support of Ukraine. And he even, uh, he says that he loves Ukrainian food uh, and uh, including borscht. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, and so, and it's great because, you know, here also in Kharkiv, there's a renaissance of Ukrainian culture, which the Soviets did uh, so much to destroy. I mean, this was, you know, I saw an interview with uh, Vivek Ramaswamy, you know, presidential candidate uh, saying, uh, I think with Piers Morgan, saying, oh, you know, we got to protect the Russian speakers from the Ukrainian, from the Ukrainians. Uh, and for example, in Kharkiv, people speak Russian. They're trying to speak Ukrainian now, but their language has nothing to do with whether or not they want freedom. They insist on being free. And today is a holiday. It's uh, the Feast of All Saints. And this is an example of the long destructive uh, arm of Russian culture or lack of culture. In Lviv, the churches are packed today. It's a festive day. You can feel the holiday. Here in Kharkiv, you don't feel that because it's been through uh, decades of oppression from the Soviets and, and Moscow, where culture and religion and even cuisine uh, were destroyed. But now people are bringing that back. And and, and it's, it's not just Ukrainians, but also Japanese here uh, mm -hmm. who are working to restore uh, the language and the culture and the traditions. Yeah, I love uh, some of those uh, stories that despite the war, it make you feel good. Joseph Lindsley in Ukraine, our thanks as always. And we look forward to our talk tomorrow. Till tomorrow. Thank you, Bob. Thank you for introducing Ukraine on your social media pages. That's very important that much more people can get more information about the situation here and how everybody can help Ukraine to stay stronger and to save all the world. 
Come on now. Oh, it's sad. Are you on? Nachi, this story.